Welcome everybody to the, uh, the fourth um, installment already of uh, the Logic and uh, Philosophy Seminar uh, of CFSS uh, of this academic year. Um, and we start off uh, 2023 with uh, Pavel Pavlovsky uh, from Ghent University, um, who is doing a postdoc there, um, and will be uh, talking about uh, the relation between modal logic and uh, non-deterministic semantics. The floor is yours. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, first, let me thank you for being here, and let me thank Peter for inviting me. It's an awesome opportunity to actually share some of my work with you. Um, so this is so the title is one framework to rule them all: how to overcome the Gunji's theorem by using non-deterministic semantics for modal logics. The idea is that this is more or less a summary of a couple of papers or a couple of drafts of papers that I have with quite a few well, with some people. So the, the, the credit for the work is also due, due to Daniel Skurt uh, from or of Ruhr University of Bochum and to Elio La Rosa from MCMP Munich. So if I say something really stupid or false, then it's probably my part of the world. <laughs> if it's something really brilliant, then it's probably due to co-authors. Okay, perfect. So first we start with some motivations. I'll tell you uh, well, what motivated me, why I'm do doing this kind of work, and why it might be interesting. And then for some reason it's yeah okay. And then we go through historical background. So we'll see what has been done in the history of non-deterministic semantics, as well as in just regular approach by using modal finitely many valued modal logics to, to modal uh, sorry finitely many <coughs> valued logics to modal logics. And then we see how to use non-deterministic semantics to do something interesting about or with the modal logics. So the, the main aim is to develop an alternative semantics for modal logic. Next, to see how far we can actually push this, this alternative account. So which system we can interpret or capture, which we can't, and why. So that's maybe that does not sound really philosophical, but in principle, you can afterwards compare this semantics that we'll get, the non-deterministic one, with all the other semantics that are already available on the philosophical market, so to say. Right? So it might be interesting because it's not, actually, it's not even clear what you can get and what you can't and why. Right? And so maybe it is then more or less the same as Kripke's possible word semantic. Maybe it is more in the spirit of neighborhood semantics, and maybe it's just incomparable with neither of them. The, another thing that you can think of is that you can well, there are some issues with some philosophical issues with the possible word semantics. Right? One is that the, the, the whole machinery of the, of the semantics seems not to be philosophically innocent, right? There's quite a few of metaphysical things to, that needs to be explained, right? Like what are these possible words? How we can access them? Are they just abstract entities? What is happening? And of course, from a like, mathematical perspective, usually mathematicians slash computer scientists do not care about this problem, but since we are philosophers, sometimes we do. So it would be one of the pot potential points where you can philosophically argue that the, 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 the semantics or the research that I'm doing might be interesting, interesting even for some people who do not believe in the, in the project of, of non-deterministic semantics in the first place. Like to just see, okay, so even if I don't believe in possible world semantics, then I have some, some alternative accounts. The second thing is that if you look at the possible world semantics, then the evaluation function is always relative to, to a world where you start with, right, or to a given world. So it is very local, whereas in, usually in many valued logics, valuations work slightly different, right? They just assign formulas, sorry, they just assign values to formulas uniformly in a way, right? It's, there is nothing relative to that. It's just this formula under this valuation has this particular value. There is no additional component that relativizes that. And then, if one needs the logic that are weaker than modal logic K, then one needs to do a bit of mental gymnastic how to how to get those with 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 uh, with possible world semantics, right? Either you need to introduce the sets of non-normal words or impossible words, or you can do something with the accessibility relation, and then switch to neighborhood semantics. 
And then, even if you initially believe in the possible worlds, and you are quite okay with the whole semantical apparatus and the ontological commitments, and as soon as you go, three, uh, go really crazy with the notion of possible world and introduce impossible worlds or non-normal worlds, then it's really a lot of explaining to do, right? In, in order to make it kind of sane from the or kind of coherent from the philosophical perspective. Yeah. And then we are back in, the, in this period, 1930-1960, right? So that's the so-called syntactical period. So the only thing that we are doing with modal logics is just we just introduce some axioms and then we do algebraic semantics on top of that. That's what we do. So there is no clear relation between, well, first, it's not even clear which modal logics are interesting or which are crucial, which are really not. That's the first thing. The second thing is that there is no, no, nothing else that, uh, this, uh, except axiomatic or algebraic approach. And third, <coughs> people back then didn't actually associate uh, modality or modal logic with the, 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 this clear link that we have now with the possible worlds. Right? For them, th there was no possible world semantics. So they were still thinking about modality as some kind of a, a syntactical operator that's supposed to do stuff and then how to capture it. So, so it's interesting perspective because it's now when we think about modality, we immediately go Kripke structure. But it was not so clear back then. No, but I, okay. So we need a bit of terminology. So we start with a propositional language L. And then of course we have some set of propositional variables. And then there we have set of connectors, which I, this I pronounce German cross, but I have no idea what's the proper English pronunciation of that guy. But then we have J, so it's a Jth German cross in, in our language, and K is the arity of the connective. And then by, and then we have the notion of logical matrix, right? So what's that? That's a triple. So we have an empty set of values. Then we have an empty set of designated values. The idea is that the designated values are supposed to work as value one, right? The, these are the values that are preserved in the notion of tautology and in the notion of a consequence relation. And then we have the set of set O that's supposed to interpret the connectives of the language and provide meaning for them. You can think about this in terms of truth tables, right? In the classical proposition logic, this is going to be the just these are going to be just truth tables for negation, conjunction, disjunction, and whatnot. And in our case, it's going to be a set of functions that interpret those guys. So it's just, it is going to be just a set of functions from the Cartesian uh, power to the n of the set of values to the set of values. And then, of course, we have the notion of evaluation, just to behave as usual, right? It just works that it takes the interpretation of the, of the, of the formula and just assign the values according to this schema. Right, so there is nothing shaded. So the valuation is basically uh, assigning some values to atoms or to propositional variables, and then if a formula is complex, the valuation just behave according to the truth tables or the functions that interpret the connectives of the language. <coughs> and then we have consequence relation. Sorry, uh, the notion of a tautology. Basically, it's just preservation of the designated values. And then we have the notion of a, of a consequence relation, which is defined in the usual way, right? So we just assume, that we just say that if all the premises are designated, so is our conclu conclusion. And this is where we equate many value logic with this, right? So for the rest of the talk, or for the remainder of the talk, by a many value logic, I mean, a logic for which there is a logical matrix that has finitely many values that is strongly complete with respect to a given logic, meaning that it describes exactly the consequence relation of that given logic. Now, we are at the historical background, so gathering the fellowship of the reading. Uh, so, back in the 60s, Lukasiewicz has this interesting uh, approach. Uh, so what he thought, like, already I invented three valued logics, right? So I was trying to solve this problem with the battle of, of tomorrow and the, the Aristotelian thing. But then, yeah, okay, so there is this notion of possibility. Yeah? Can I do better? 
And actually what he, he, he devised here are four values. And first, maybe not first, but one of the first like semantic approach to, to model logic that was not uh, algebraic. Which, well, it is kind of algebraic, but not necessarily straight yet algebraic, right? So the idea is that we have four values, T, T, F, F. Uh, the designated value is capital T. And then the negation just flips capital T to small f, small t to capital F, small f to capital T, f to t. Uh, so the box operation works as follows. So for those two guys, it gives you a designated value for the rest non-designated value, and I will give you the capital T. And implication works in more or less as expected. So for the classical kind of, so for the monospawnless thing, it works as it's supposed to. So if we have here the T or T, and here F or F, it gives us F, and for the rest it gives either capital or small T. The problem with this semantic is that it's really hard to say what are those truth values. And because my initial idea was that, well, they're supposed to correspond maybe to this necessary true, possibly true, possibly false, necessary false. But if we look at the tables, they do not. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and I read the Lukasiewicz paper from 53 to, to, to find the inspiration, what he meant. He was also under specific, he just said, no, no, it's just a Cartesian product of these two algebras. Oh, thank you. Well, so. So, yeah, so we do have some kind of, of semantics. We don't know the meaning of the truth values, but we do have some properties of the logic, right? So the first thing that is quite clear that this logic does not have the rule of necessitation. Right, why? Well, because uh, the, the only designated value is capital T. So it will not, so the, the rule of necessitation will not work. And actually it doesn't have any tautologies of the form box of something. Then what we do have is this, the axiom, the model axiom 4, which is kind of okay. That's a sensible axiom of model logic. We also have the reverse of Okay, so, so, so far good, right? This is also something that can be valid in creepy semantics, no problems. There are no philosophical issues with this axiom. We have this as well. So it's a kind of like closure on the modus ponens within the scope of the, of the box. Okay. Sounds sensible, right? It's also probably in most of the monologics. But then we have this, and it's like, uh, we don't need that. Right? So if something is necessary, then there is a sentence that is equivalent to stating its own necessity. It's not provably in most monologics, right? We also have this. Pavel, you yeah. say uh, there is a sentence, but you mean for all, for any sentence? Yeah, for for any. Yes, thank you. Yes, for any. Because so, the there is seems quite yes, 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 viable. And also, if there are any questions or if I say something <coughs> that seems stupid or is actually stupid, just you know, you feel, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, yes, yes, for any sentence. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Then we have this as well, and then we have this as well. So it's clear that you cannot find, uh, from today's perspective, a decent Kripke frame for that, or actually like de decent even generalization of Kripke semantics for, for this logic. And people label this logic as garbage. And basically it's like, oh, okay, we tried many valid logic approach, does not work. Mm -mm. Let's move to something else. Oh, sorry, there's an additional one. Yeah, and this is what I already, I already told you. So then the whole paradigm of doing model logic with many values, as many value logic, just was kind of took strong hit by, by, by these problems. And then in the 40s, Dugunjis proved the following theorem, right? He was, he was thinking about, okay, so I will change, change the, the order of work. Instead of devising a semantical account of a new model logic, I will take the model logic that are currently you know, studied, and that was the, the Lewis systems, S1, S2, and S3, and S4, and S5. And then I'll just try to find semantics for those. And then what the Dugunj is proved by reinterpreting Gödel's theorem, or sorry, Gödel's theorem about 
similar thing or the same thing for intuitionistic logic is that if you restrict the number of values to finite, then you cannot find a logical matrix for neither of, those, of, of these systems, which was like a very strong hit for the whole approach of using modal, uh, sorry, many value logics for modality. That was basically like you can't. Just a small question, was there an alternative available at that point? Algebraic, before, uh, algebraic semantics. Yeah, okay. That was the debate thing. Yeah. People love it. And now it's almost, <laughs> almost no one is working there, but yeah. But people, yeah, that was the only alternative. They were doing these uh, algebras and, uh, yeah. I don't know much about algebraic semantics from the logic, but, but I know that it was the predominant thing. So either you studied them axiomatically or you were just doing something algebraic, but those were really kind of like syntactically close together. And then people who tried to do stuff from that, who were motivated, like Bukasiewicz, by, by semantic investigations, had to do well, stuff, right? And then, <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's, that's the picture so far. But it's even, it's even worse, actually, right? Because you can generalize the Gutubunji's theorem for the following. So we fix a language. It's propositional model language. Uh, sorry, propositional model language with two model operators that's supposed to be into the final. And then we say that we have model logic H and it's axiomatized by propositional axioms, by the rule of modus polens, and that's it. So actually we don't we don't even need the diamond here. Sorry. Yes. And then if we if so so this is the system H, sorry. And then system H does not have many value semantics. What is even most worse, no system between H and S5 has it. Which, and if you look at the system H, it's just modal logic, sorry, it's just propositional logic in the extended language. So it's really a weak <coughs> system, right? So then it would mean that modality and many valuedness does not come together. And now we are kind of like in the in the in this part where I'm showing you some some glimpse of hope, to put it uh, poetically. Right? So non-deterministic semantics to the rescue, bringing the world ring to more. A bit of history. So, first idea of like something that was resembling non-deterministic semantics was by this, uh, by the super famous logician that I just learned recently of his existence, Otto Karzig, known to some as, as the father of Czech uh, logic. So that's like very important figure in philosophy, in history of, of analytics slash logic, uh, philosophy of logic for for Czech people. And then he had this paper <coughs> in the 38, I believe, where he was saying something about using complex values. So that was something like multidimensional values, right? But he, he didn't come up with non-deterministic semantics or anything like that. He just said that you can kind of interpret the, the values as, as, as tuples. That was the, his roughly the idea. Then we have nothing for a long time, and then there is Rescher with this paper in 62 where he's doing stuff like, well, so we have this conditional in, in, in propositional logic, but it does not work well with natural language. Maybe we can use something like non-deterministic semantics or like undetermined values to study the, the, the implication of the natural language. And then his conclusion was, was uh, and now we can't do that. It's just trivially just collapsed to, to classical, uh, to, many, to classical many valid stuff. And the funny thing is that he was wrong because it does not. But he didn't prove it. He just was uh, a remark in, in the paper. Then, then we have almost nothing till the, the, the 73. By uh, the, those are the, 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 the papers by Evlev when he's so those papers, so the, the one from 73 is only available in Russian. And the other one, this one is in English. And his idea is, was more or less to use non-deterministic semantics and actually like more or less proper non-deterministic semantics. So with like many values and many values and everything for model logic that are weaker than model logic K. So he was studying like model logic without the rule of necessitation. Whereas Kerns did something else, he said, 
I don't like possible worlds, right? So I'm going to develop an alternative account for formal logics, right? And then he just provides a, a way to use non-deterministic semantics to, to characterize T as 4 and as 5. And then nothing completely, right? There are these three, three papers, well, one of them is in Russian, two of them are in English, and then, then, then suddenly shows up Avron, who is taking this non-deterministic paradigm of doing stuff and then formalizing it, like introducing the appropriate notions, doing meta theory, and then he's saying, it's awesome, let's do it for proof theory. And then there are plenty, plenty of results in this like, labeled sequence calculus and whatnot. And then he, his next aim is like, okay, let's do some paraconsistent stuff with it. And there are also an interesting specific couple of results about this uh, paraconsistent systems and how you can, some of them can be captured in, uh, by using non-deterministic semantics and some of them can't and there's a lot of interaction and, and a lot of uh, interesting results to, to, that has been already achieved. But nothing specifically about monology. And then these papers are actually, or have been recently rediscovered in 2016 by uh, Marcelo Cornelio's group and Hitoshi Omori. With what is funny that they were, that they were rediscovered independently. So it was the right side the guys apparently for, for these kind of things because people kind of at the same time in two different places in Bochum and in uh, Punam, Brazil. Sorry, not Punam, but Campinas in Brazil. They uh, work on that independently. And so, as people say, the rest is history, right? So recently, like in the last five years, I think that the number of papers on modal logic and non-deterministic semantics tripled or quadrupled. So there are plenty of people who applied for logic, for logic standards, maybe five, or sorry, seven. So it's like almost wood stuff, right, for, for logical standards. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, so we are going strong, huh? <coughs> <coughs> So, <coughs> this is so what's the, the semantics about? So instead of a logical matrix, we have something that we call N matrix. Sometimes N without the uh, uh, minus. And it's also a triple, so we have the set of values, a non-empty set of designated values, so more or less it works as, it, as in the previous case, right? As in the case of uh, logical matrix. And this is the, the important difference. So what, what O does, is instead of giving an interpretation that takes the arity of the, of the connective and gives you a single value, it gives you a set of values. Right? So for instance, you can think of this junction and then suddenly if P is 1, Q is 1, then this junction can be either 0 or, or 1. Right? So it gives you a set. And by doing that, actually, you can express a lot of interesting things. Right? And this is captured by, by doing this for now. Right? So it's just a function from from the eight Cartesian power of the set of variables to the power set of the set of variables minus the empty set, right? So, could maybe be useful uh, for the group, just for some people, to explain what designated means. Uh, oh, yeah, so, so as I, I think I already told them, but just to oh, recapitulate, uh, uh, designated means that they behave as one in propositional logic, meaning that those are the values that's supposed to be preserved in being a tautology or in the consequence relation. And then what is the notion of what is the notion of valuation? And so now valuation works slightly different. So basically what it does is just simply takes one value for each of, of these sets. So it specifies exactly which of these values you can have, which gives you a so which if you start with like two variables P and Q. Suppose that both of them have value one, and then they, that you have this junction that gives you zero or one. Right? Then in propositional logic, you would have this information would be enough to infer that the disjunction is already one. Right? But in, in non-deterministic semantics, you have the interpretation of this connectives gives you the set. And then valuation, you can have valuation that works like this. And then in this valuation splits into two. Right? You have P1, where the disjunction is zero, and then you have P2 where the disjunction is 1, right? Which means that the assignment, so the, the as, as, uh, assigning values to propositional parameters does not uniquely determine the values of all the complex formulas of the, of the language, right? But it still narrows the, the set of possible valuations down. 
and the notion of tautologies as already has been explained. Perfect. Okay, so we start with the language that has only box. And now the idea is that the values are going to be two dim dimensional. Right? On, on the first dimension, they will give us information about the, whether a formula is true or false. And the second dimension is going to be giving us the information whether a formula is <coughs> necessary or whether it's not necessary. And we will use the same, uh, the, the, the same names for the values as in Łukasiewicz's case, right? But now clearly we have the philosophical concept of what, of the meaning of the values, right? Capital T is true and necessary, small t is true but not necessary, small f is not true and not necessary, capital F is not true and necessary. And then we can characterize the logic H, and this is the matrix for this logic. So we have four values, two, two of them are designated. Uh, in the case of Ukasiewicz logic, only the capital T was designated. And this is the interpretation. So basically, nothing is tautology for, for, for box. And this is the conditional. And the conditional works more or less as a class, some kind of algebraic product of a product, sorry, of, of classical proposition logic with classical proposition <coughs> logic. So we have two values that behave as one and two values that behave as zero. And, and then it, this is just to ensure that all the classical uh, tautologies are still valid. We can compare it with Lukasiewicz logic. It's in the red. Oh, sorry, I should say. So, so this means that, that the interpretation of the connective assigns a set of two values, right? So it's f and small f. And then the valuation singles out one of them. So we can compare this with Lukasiewicz. So here is just f instead of the set. Here, here is a difference. For some weird reason, Lukasiewicz had f here and works like that. And then the implication, more or less, the same. But in our case, in the case of non-deterministic semantics, we have more than one value. But usually, the, the, the value specified by the Lukasiewicz logic is one of the values specified by the interpolation of the connective in, in this table. And we can strengthen this semantics. Right? We can actually add axiom t. We can add axiom k. We can add axiom 4 to that, to that thing. So to get t, what we need to do is we need to make sure that the value for, for, for capital T is the only one that is designated. All right? So we are changing the meaning of, of this value. Actually, what, that's what's happening, right? So we are just removing the possibility of some true, false formulas being necessary. We just say if something is necessary, it has to be true, right? Because this is what the axiom is saying. For axiom four, on the other hand, what we do is that we say that if a value is capital, meaning that it's supposed to be necessary, because that's what capital stands for, right? Those are the necessary values, or the ones that present necessity. Uh, Necessariness, you need to give the, 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 the capital value. If you do that, then it means that if you have value that starts with the box, the box of it is also going to be uh, designated. And for axiom k, what you need to do is you need to change the interpretation for these values. For the, for the cases where you have capital letter and small letter going for small letters, for t and f. So if you do that, you can, do it. I mean, you can calculate that by just simply checking all the valuation, but it's a lot of work. I did it twice, and I don't want to do it for the third time. It took a couple of hours. I've got a couple of hundreds of valuations, and none of them are kind of easily, you, know, you can't predict what is happening, or well, not always at least. But OK. So now what we did was we started with a language that has only box. But we'd like to have diamond as well. What do we do? Well, one way of, of incorporating diamond is simply by 
adding it to the language and then just adding another dimension for the values. So now we have eight values, right? Depending whether we, we you can you can view it as a three form, right? Here we have zero or one, here we have zero or one, and here we have zero or one, and this is true or false, this is necessary or not, and this is possible or not. Right? Which gives us eight conceptually it gives us uh, eight options. And this is what we can do, right? So we have capital T with diamond. The lower index diamond says that the value is supposed to represent that the possible uh, that possibility of the formula. We have capital T, which stands for true, necessary, and not possible. We have lowercase t with diamond, which is true, not necessary, possible. We have T00, which is true, not necessary, not possible. Capital F, not true, necessary, possible, because there is diamond. The one without diamond, so not true, necessary, not possible. And small with the diamond, not true, not necessary, possible. And the, the, really, the really negative value, not true, not possible, not necessary. Right? That's a lot of values, especially if you have no deterministic stuff and you have this splitting thing. And then we have those guys are designated, kind of obviously because they preserve truth and designations about truth preservation. Okay. First problem. We have two model operators. How can we be sure that those operators actually denote possibility and necessity in, in kind of one dimension? Right? Because in principle we can use two symbols for just two model operators that are not related at all. And there is nothing in our semantics that kind of relates those operators. But it's very easy to, to make, <coughs> to kind of incorporate that in our semantics. So we start with splitting four duality principles. So the definability principles of box and diamond into four implications. And then we can just, well, sorry, the fifth one is add all of them together to make sure that they are equivalent. And then we can just use the following thing capital D with this overline, this is, we use this for the set of all non-designated values. So in this semantics, this is simply the set F diamond, F, small f, and small f diamond. And the capital D is going to be the set of all designated values. So simply what we do here is in order to make sure that the, the first axiom holds, we and this is interesting observation, right? Because we do not tweak the interpretation of modalities, because this is given by the meaning of the truth values, but we tweak the interpretation <coughs> of negation to get to get to, to those guys, right? Because there are negations involved. So actually what is interesting here is that is the kind of fault of negation that that, that your logic do not uh, think about these formulas as equivalent. So to get the, the first action, we need to tweak the, the T diamond and F diamond to those sets, and T and F to those, to these guys. And to get to only to D2, we need to go here for those values to have D3. Uh, I mean, there is no like principal reason, or well, probably there is some reason, but it's not that interesting. I mean, I, I actually just calculated the possibilities and make sure that it works, right? So there's not that much of, of, of philosophical intuition here. It's just brute force engineering, <laughs> right? And then we have the the, the, ax the, the, the fourth ax sorry the fourth axiom, given by those. And then in order to get all of them, we just simply take the, the intersections at each level, right? So here we are left out with F. Here we are left out with capital F, diamond F, capital. F diamond, T, capital T, <coughs> small case T diamond, and capital T diamond. And of course, if you want to have just subset of them, just take intersection pointwise, and, and it, it's warranted that you will always have a non-empty set of values, right? Because otherwise, you just end up with not, not with the logic. And we can do even better, right? We can, on top of that, 
So everything so far is modular, right? That's an interesting observation as well. So you can add any of these axioms for, for interdefinability. You can, uh, and then you can go for the implication that satisfies K or not. And then it gives you like a very big range of logics. So you can al also do the, the axiom four, right? So we've seen how to do it in four valid case, but we can do it also in, in the eight valid case. We can actually even go for the axioms that involve diamonds. Like axiom five. So, so, sorry, I have difficulty to interpret the axiom four. So yeah, I think there is a. There is a oh yes, that's a very yeah, that's, weird. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good like yeah. So that, that, yeah, exactly that was the point. So actually, that was like like uh, not sanity check, but like whether I'm still being listened to. No, actually, I made a typo. <laughs> so so this is supposed to be this. Yeah, so, yeah, so the implication is just. Uh, I don't think for implication. Okay. Yeah. That's that's yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's available. But thanks. And then we have axiom five and axiom <coughs> two. Right? Okay, so just probably yeah. These are the three that we start with, right? So those are the well known axioms. And then we can you know, add any of them or any combination of them, right? And it's Interestingly, if we have, if you want to add axiom four, we only need to tweak the interpretation of box for capital letters, right? We need to ensure that the capital letters give us interpretation capital letters, right? Because if the letter is capital, that means that we have box. But if it gives you as interpretation capital letter, that means that the, the box formula has also box. So it's box box. So box implies box box. For axiom five, you need to do a bit of tweaking of the modality of the, the diamond, and the same for B. And here, again, everything is modular, right? You can take what, any of them with any combinations of the axioms and with K or without K. Now, the point being, the logics that we studied or I presented so far do not have the rule of necessitation. And in principle, it's not easy to get it back, or there is, a not, that there is no direct way of getting it back. Actually, you can even extend the Gunji's theorem to prove that, it, that there is no non-deterministic semantics for these systems. But what you can do is that you can do or introduce some kind of, of a valuation restriction or filtration procedure so that the remaining valuation, so you start with all the possible valuations, right, and then you apply the filtration procedure, and then what you are left with are the valuations that do work decently with necessitation. And one way of the, or the only way that is known at the moment is the, the, the way of, of nth level valuations. So what do we do? We start with a valuation in a, some kind of N matrix in some kind of L, right? So we have logic that is induced by <coughs> a deterministic matrix and everything is done in the modal context. Then we have this thing, SP, called super designated values. The idea is that those are the values that are designated and they are capital in our notation. So they preserve the, the meaning of box. So it's kind of like, I preserve both truth of the formula and the necessitation of the formula, or the necessariness of the formula. And then we say that evaluation is of zero level, if it's just with respect to the set of, of, of super evaluations, if it's just evaluation in the, in the matrix, right? And it's n plus one level, if and only if, for any nth level evaluation, if V assigns a super designated value to a formula, sorry, if V assigns a super designated value to every formula V that has a designated value for any previous level, then it's a. <laughs> oh no. No, no, no. Snooze or. Yes. Snooze. Snooze. Please <laughs> Yes. No updates. It's very intrusive, our system. <laughs> Stupid updates. Okay, so, so <coughs> that's a recursive definition. So, so you start with, with all valuations and then you say, hey, look, if you look at the all valuations, this formula is a tautology. Then it has to have the super designated value. But there are valuations 
according to which it has just designated value, remove them. So that's the idea, right? And then you are at the first level. And at the first level, you have new tautologies, but again, they can still have just, uh, they can still be assigned to just designated values, not super designated values. Remove them again. And then, unfortunately, for most logics, you need to repeat this process. Yeah, uh, at infinity, right? And then you just take the, the valuations that satisfy it for, for the whole thing, right? So you just take the intersection of, of, of those valuations. And what is interesting, if you go for the, value, for, for the values capital T diamond and capital T, you just get the rule of persistence back for any combinations of the logic that we mentioned. So basically you can go, and this is awesome because these are, some of these logics are actually the logic that you cannot capture by using Kripke semantics, right? Like for instance, logic H with necessitation. There are no modal topologies, sorry, there are no modal axioms, just with the rule of necessitation. Sad face, no Kripke semantics, right? All the logics that do not have axiom K, the same thing. So it seems to be slightly more powerful than Kripke semantics. But on the other hand, there are certain things that you can do with Kripke semantics, like you can make sure that you have these like weird, really complex axioms doing something with something, whereas it's not so obvious whether you can uh, have them in non-deterministic semantics. Because, I mean, Kripke semantics from that perspective has infinitely many options, and here we are still kind of contained within the eight values, right? So there's only finitely many systems, actually, that you can describe. Which ones we can actually describe here? I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, now, so now we are proceeding to showing what we can do with these semantics with respect to box, right? To do that, we need the notion of simple refinement, which basically says that if you have two n matrix, n matrices, that are based on the same language and everything is keeps fixed. M2 is a simple refinement of M1 if and only if they have the same values, they have the same designated values, and the interpretation of connectives is just a, kind of like a restriction of the interpretations of the of, of, of the second of the second one. Right? So you can think it of a strengthening of not under specification but like so not over specification but like specification of one of, 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 of the N matrix. And then we, we introduce the, the notion of simple box refinement. This is the specification, but only with respect to the interpretation of the box operation. And then the, the, the rest is kept constant. And we start with the eight values, right? So we have this eight value framework, plenty of values, a lot of them, eight. And that, a side note, there is a paper by Hitoshi Omori and Daniel Skurk where they employed 16 valued uh, uh, non-deterministic semantics for some kind of, of modal logics that are even more tricky with respect to certain re reversing the rule of necessitation, for instance, with instead of box going for not the diamond, not five. But eight is my sweet spot. So. I come to 16. <laughs> okay, and uh, these are the designated values. So more or less familiar so as, as in the previous slides. And then, of course, we have the, the, the set all that interprets the, the connective of the language. And then we, we, we take the rest of the usual connectives, like conjunction, disjunction, equivalence, to be definable in the usual or non-primitive in the usual way. Or if there is a bit of work to be done to, to, to kind of make sure that everything works, but it's more or less tedious and not philosophically important to kind of make sure that the definitions do work. And then we have this. So we have stuff for, for, for uh, negation. So we now assume that we have the D1 to D4 axioms. So, so the, 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 the diamond and box are interdefinable. This is the starting point. And this is the starting implication. This implication satisfies K. And that's the weakest logic. Uh, that's our starting point. Right, so we, that's the interpretation of the remaining connected that we keep that we keep constant. This we will keep constant, and this is where we are going to play around. So we'll check what would happen if we change one of those entries, and we actually study almost all possible combinations of these entries. There's like a couple of hundreds, of thousands of logics here, I believe. 
Yeah, this is what I more or less already said, right? So we are only interested. Oh no, sorry. That's that's also an important an important thing. So for the designated values that are capital, so the ones that preserve the, necess the necessitation or the necessariness of the formula, we only consider those refinements that still assigns the capital letters to that formula. And this is because if we do not do that, then the, the procedure of the nth level valuation does not work, or it may not work. Actually, it's not known, but I was not able to make it work. That way, so far. And then what is interesting is that actually certain choices, right? So certain things that you put here, and like instead, for instance, of all the values, you put here capital T. So some of these choices do not strengthen the logic. Right? And then, of course, the question is okay, so what is the the strongest logic, or the strongest, uh, sorry, what is the strongest semantics that you can postulate so that the resulting logic remains the same? And the answer is there is no unique solution to that problem. There are some of the maximally strong logic, but so maximally strong uh, refinements that gives you the same logic. And now what we are going to do is we are going, first I, I will show you which which of these maximal strengthenings are, are our point, our, our starting points, and then we'll go row by row uh, playing with the interpretations of the of the box. So first let's A B C D be in the following sense, right? So A is either capital T diamond small t or capital T T diamond and E F G H capital F diamond small f capital F and small f diamond. And then, if you consider the set of, the, of this string thing, then each of them does not result in a strong logic. So these are the maximum points. So if something assigns three values, for instance, then it also does not change the logic. Yeah, so there are like, plenty of options to go for, but it, it just splits. And here are the, 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 the points that, that if you strengthen, you get something more than you started with. And we go. So first we start with the axioms A. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on will denote the row that we are working with, right? Oh no, so... No, so actually... Uh, yes, yes, yeah, I was right. And then the, 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 in the, the lower index denotes the option. So if we have five whose value is capital T diamond, then box can be this, or this, or this, or this, or this. There are five options to go for. And then each of these moves will give you the following answer. It's a lot of completeness of the roofs. <laughs> and if you go for B, so interestingly we only have five options for each of the capital values, and then we have seven options for each of this lowercase value. That's because we are removing the options where the capital letter goes to um, lowercase letter, right? Because we, otherwise we are not sure whether the, the rule of necessitation you can be <coughs> regained within this, this framework. So we go for, for C. Yay! And actually the axioms are more or less straightforward if you look at the meaning of the values, right? So lowercase t diamond says, well, the formula is true, check. It's not necessary, check and it's possible, check. And then the interpretation of box of this formula is this. So the box of the formula is supposed to be uh, false, and false here, false here, sure, but we already have it here, so we are not putting it here. And then it can be either uh, so, so, so those two truth values differ when it comes to the status of box box, right? It says box box is preserved. This says it's not. But they both preserve diamond box. So we put diamond box here. And that's for all of them. And for, for the lowercase uh, letters, then the actions are slightly longer. And then we go through, through all of that. And of course, everything is super modular, so you can take any combinations of anything, and it's always non-empty set of inter. It always gives you the non-empty set 
or it always results in an, an inappropriate in matrix. Oh, I'm already for okay. Zooming in on the axis with index one, right? So if you look at the axis with index one, and we, if we all, if we all, uh, if we add all of them, then what we get is that each of these particular axes describe one situation, a combination of necessary, true, possible, or not possible, not necessary, and false. And it basically says that in this particular scenario, diamond box phi. So if we add all of them, then we just simply are this boils down to adding box diamond five as an axis. And then we can add any combinations of them and just simply calculate that what is happening with just proposition logic. Or if we are lazy, we can just go to this website, which is an implementation of kind of like a Salquist theorem slash cryptic conditions finder. And then we can postulate any combinations of our axioms, and actually it gives you the corresponding Kripke uh, frame condition that you need for the logic, uh, for the proper for the model logic, for the possible possible word semantics to have. And of course, it only works for the logic that do validate K, right? So we can just simply write down any axiom that has been presented. And then it should work and give you, give you the answer. And also it works for the combinations of the axiom. You simply just go for the conjunction. What is also interesting is that for some of these logics, the hierarchy of the valuations of the nth level has a slightly simpler structure. Namely, if we start with logic that validates axiom 4, then the resulting logic only needs one level of valuation service to, to regain the rule of necessitation. So if you're on the first level, it's already giving you the closure of the, the rule of necessitation. What is also interesting about the hierarchy itself is, uh, is the following. Let me first start with the, the intuition why you need uh, many levels, right? So if we start with P, if P then P, right? Then this is a tautology, so, 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 so the interpretation will always give us the set of all designated values, right? Here. And then if we consider the box of it, the box simply will remove the lowercase letter from it. Right, so that, that, that would correspond to going for the first or first level valuations. So here we will have just capital T and T. But then, Yes, 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 right. And then here we'll, uh, we just get the set of all the value uh, of all the possible designated sets. But then if you add another box, here again you can get, you, you can get the just go for the lowercase letter and you can get false falsity of this axiom. So then you need to go for the second level. And on the second level, this is becoming a tautology, this formula. So then you are removing from this set valuations and you only have these ones. So then this becomes a tautology. And then if you have another box, blah, blah, blah. And then since you can add infinitely many boxes, you need infinitely many numbers. The other thing that is interesting, but less, uh, less positive, so to say, or actually quite negative, I just write it down, yeah, is the following. So if we start with search thing, for instance. Right, such formula, and we take the following valuation. So here it's got T diamond, this goes for F, this goes for T diamond, this goes for F, this goes for T. So this box F, the implication goes for F. Here we go for T, 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 T. Right? It seems that we can falsify this formula. So it's not going to be a tautology. 
But what is but but this is actually something that is provable in model logic S4. So even if we start with non-deterministic semantic for S4, this seems to be a counterexample to the completeness theorem, right? Because this is what well, we found a valuation that works, and it seems that there is nowhere here something that will be kind of filtered out. But the problem is that you that the non-deterministic semantics with the level valuations lacks the analysity. So if you start with partial valuation, meaning you assign values only to some formulas, then you may make a mistake and do not actually see that some other formulas that are not even sub-formulas of these formulas may influence the valuation that you are considering or the partial valuation that you are considering. And actually, if you filter out through the, through the axiom K, in this case, <coughs> going here for the end of evaluation will remove some of the valuations in that formula. And then it will turn out to be a tautology action. And this is something really tricky. So it does not give you like a decent method of verifying whether something is a tautology or not. And now people are working on that. And yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> There, there is a paper where they actually showed some, some kind of procedure for getting the analysis back in the case of T in this form, but so far it's not clear what is the underlying principle. They just by brute force says, ah, okay, so we can actually take this set and this set of formulas and this set of formulas, and then if the evaluation is close under those, then it's you know, good enough to kind of give us the, the answer. But it's not clear what is the underlying principle here. And of course, what is the relation between this semantics and possible word semantics and all the remaining semantics? These are all open questions. And there's like some people working on that, but we'll see how it goes. And back to the, to the slides. So, so it works for the, for the axiom 4, right? Axiom 4 limits the hierarchy to one level only, but for the rest of the axioms, the answers are unknown. There was a hypothesis that what is actually deciding for the, the, what is actually crucial for having the hierarchy finite is the number of non-equivalent modalities that are definable in a given logic, but it turned out to be false. So there's some, some other property that kind of make the hierarchy finite, but it's not clear which one. Thank you. I hope it was not too clear. Shall we just take five minutes, uh, short break? Sure. Yeah. And then...
Maybe we can restart. Uh, so, uh, quest the floor is open for questions. Uh, who wants to? So, I. <laughs> sure, go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have a, a, a name. It's a naive question, but for once it's, it's a really one because usually when you begin, I have a naive question, it's not naive at all. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the value refinement mm -hmm. techniques, so you have to remove this, everything to keep the. I did not understand why, 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 how you do that except by brute force, like you showed, or what, what is the motivation to get that? Is that your semantic is, yeah. there's, it's too rich and you have to get rid of stuff, and so but why not we get at the beginning? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, something. yeah, I think I can explain that, but we can try at least. So, yes, so, so the problem is that we have two designated values, right? So if you have this, this formula, and then the, the output for the for the implication is go. Let me just wait a second. So we have this. And here we can have capital T, T, lowercase T, and T. And in our definition of tautology, we are interested in truth preservation. So all of these values, intuitively, they preserve truth, so they're good to go. Right? Perfect. But then, if we add box, then the situation is slightly different, right? Because box says that that formula must be necessary. But some of the values here say, no, it's not going to be. So here we will get some non-designated values. So if we do not do the refinement, we cannot distinguish in the object le le level or in the object language those two cases. Okay. And simply, if we go for truth preservation, then nothing is going to be necessary because, well, because we have these two types of values, right? So nothing of the form box, something is going to be formula. We can fix that by brute form by saying, just remove the, the, the lower ones. Yes, but, but then it will just collapse to being true. And this is like half of the Lukasiewicz problem, actually, with the logic, right? Because he couldn't make this distinction in the first place. So this is why in his system you also do not have topologies. You have only one designated value. And by, by, by this, he had this really weird topologies true, or sorry, valid. Whereas here, it's we can make this distinction, but the price to pay is that we don't have the topologies of this form. Hence, we need the strengthening. And the strengthening works more or less on the like intuitively, right? So it, it basically says that if I have a formula that is a topology according to your semantics, so that's these values, you can think of it as like a children learning model logic, right? It's, or a child. A child is learning model logic and it kind of do some calculations and then it, the, the, the child arrived at the, at the thing that, oh, if P then P is a topology. Great. Right. And then, since he learned this new information, it's a tautology, then let's say that he believes that tautologies are necessary. So then what he wants to do, because this is from, 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 from Kripke's point or from Kripke's semantics point of view, what is happening? Tautologies are necessary. And then he learns, oh, this is a tautology, so I need to remove those things because, the, 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 oh, sorry, tautologies are necessary, so I need to remove those things because they do not say that the tautologies are necessary. And then the children can say, oh, this guy is a topology now. Mm -hmm. But then if the, if the child goes for the second box, again, he, you can have similar problems. So then the children now know that this is a topology. So then at this level, he needs to remove for she those values. And then this is going to be topology. But unfortunately, if you're really stubborn or the kid is really smart, he can go or she can go for like infinitely many boxes. This is why you need the whole kernel. It's a bit like with Tarski approach to language, right? Because if like, there is this Tarski axiomatic axiomatic theory of truth, and then you can also go for for so it, or or even better, Kripke's approach to truth, right? At the beginning, you, you in the extension, you just put things that are <coughs> true arithmetically, and then at the second level, you put the truth of the truth of the previous level, and so on. But in that in that in that set, you need to go. Slightly higher than oh my god. 
I mean, if you need to go for slightly bigger infinity, because uh, the trick is in first sort of languages, at omega level, you can define new predicates or new things, and you need to, to kind of account for those as well. Hence, you need to go to omega ck1, I believe, so they can judge in the order. But you, do you not see that as a, as a, as a weakness of this? I do. Yeah, but I'm, yeah, yeah. If, 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 if I have to, to get rid of semantic of possible world to do that, we can discuss which is a, which yeah, is yeah, a yeah, more elegant yeah. way. Yeah, I yeah, totally agree, sure. but, but here you can do certain things that you cannot do with the okay. Fair enough, okay. So there but yeah, I totally agree. I'm not saying that this is better, I'm saying this is different. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, what, but is there a inner interest in having this transfinite operation? You know, for instance, in, in Dasky, maybe you can use <coughs> two point transfinite uh, demonstration to have a completion. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, is there, because maybe it's not a blockness, maybe you can use it. Oh yeah, so actually it does. Uh, well, it does have like a slightly weird color on it, that if you restrict your attention to a particular level, then what you are actually getting is this really weird form of, of rule of necessitation, meaning that if something is probable on the nth level, uh, then you can do it, then you can add box in your logic. So at each step, you are closing your internal logic of box on the, on, uh, under the things that are topologies in the previous level. And this gives you like an infinite version of stronger and stronger rules of necessitation that finally merge into the, the, the true rule of necessitation. Yeah, but it doesn't allow you to avoid good and still remember. No, but, but it, it gives you some, some interesting things because there are, there are some of the logics that do that actually. Like there is this model logic GLS, uh, which is, I think it's GLS, uh, Gendel's not logic, right? So, so the aim is that box is probability, and then they can add a reflection schema, meaning this thing. But then what they do, they add this, but they weaken the rule of necessitation only to GL. And this is more or less what we can here represent, but <coughs> unfortunately, we cannot represent, well, it's not clear how to get the GL in this setting. I tried, I failed, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we did. Yeah, but that would be awesome. <laughs> Hence I tried, but yeah, so far it's, and now I think you, you cannot, so I'll, I'm trying to prove that you cannot, but I am also, it's still a, a relatively a new field, so. But yeah, but uh, coming down is, of course, on one hand, weakness, it's like, oh great, so instead of infinitely many words, now I have infinitely many filtration of the valuations, a great job. So yeah, I do agree, it's like, it's not that we are presenting something better, but something different. And like, probably, there is actually a sort of like, very interesting relation between what is happening at these steps and, what, and, and uh, possible words, right? Because you can think of, of this, uh, you can think of these things in terms of possible words, right? Because actually those, those valuations are going to be maximum consistent subsets, right? So you can just simply go for infinitely many values. Those are evaluations represented as possible words, and then there are some relations between them. Okay, what does exactly the end level valuation technique do? What, how, you know, how, they, how you should write down the, the arrows? We don't know. But that would be a good paper. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. Or it's this for no, 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 no. But thanks for the talk. Uh, basically, I hate to say that it's not good enough at project to follow everything at the end of the days. You, you told us, uh, I would like to pursue the, the metaphysical uh, consequences of your, your logic and how it relates to the possible worlds. I mean, you said it's still uh, going and it's still uh, okay, yeah, but yeah. I would like to know the perspective. Maybe you motivated that with uh, an application that I have in mind. Uh, your uh, separation of the valuation and the non-deterministic part seems to be very close to what uh, some people have uh, proposed for uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, modern interpretation of quantum mechanics, where you have yeah. the probability system that is uh, mm -hmm. taken seriously, and then you say, Jim, well, your valuation is another step. And uh, usually, the possible world uh, approach to, model, uh, to, uh, to these modal ideas can uh, be used to support the minimal notation of mechanics. So if you can do another kind of model uh, logic with your stuff, which is different from possible worlds, 
I will have maybe to see what kind of metaphysical consequences it will have. Yes, so I know almost nothing about yeah, quantum mechanics, to be fair, but I do know that there is a paper yeah. where they build non-deterministic semantics, not model logic, okay. but non-deterministic semantics for quantum processes. Okay. So for some of them. So then the, the link the link has been already explored. It's been published in a journal, I believe a physics journal. Is it the Iron Half? The Brazilian logician that did that? No, it, I think it was done by a physicist actually. Oh, okay. Because I don't know the name, so I presume it must be. But what? I'm now not remembering the name, but I can check it afterwards. But so that has been done. Okay. What are the metaphysical implications of, of this thing? So I don't know yet. But the, the uh, ideally, uh, what, what I wanted to accomplish, so the, the, the aim that I'm starting with, or let's say the angle that I'm coming from, is slightly more like an engineer than a philosopher. So it's like, so there is a problem. I have these tools. Can I fix it? Or you know, can I build a machine that does the same but is different? <laughs> So, and, and then after building the framework, I can just think like, okay, so I built this machine, okay, what can I do with this machine and what are the repercussions? It's like you know, with computers, right? First, they, they, they had this theoretical model of computer Turing machine, then they built computers, and then they thought about you know, phys phil philosophical aspects, not the other way around. So I think it's, but now the semantics are already there. But to be fair, I, I, so one thing that you could do is that, you could think of this uh, from like uh, episte epistemic perspective, right? As agents not, not having enough information to judge certain uh, connectives either way, right? They only have this information that narrows the interpolation down, but not sufficiently. And then you could kind of push this idea maybe to kind of in explain the whole semantics in, the, in these terms, okay. I guess. Well, well actually, that would make a bit of sense. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's going to be to share that, and uh, it would support uh, other kind of interpretation of yeah. mechanics that are more informal. Yeah, but, but this, oh, this, I, I have no idea. No, so but uh, this is like okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, still not, not, not there yet. Yeah, question. No, I'm still about the the conversion to possible world. So. So you said that one of the problems, at least for you, <coughs> is the world of the relative valuation? Yes, this is that, yeah. So here, it's not relative. No, it's just... However... <laughs> however, some of them are bad. Yeah. So you have yeah, to yeah, go yeah. blah, blah, blah to yeah, get the yeah. valuation and yeah. maybe yeah. never... Yeah, and I know it's, it's, tough. Tough. it's a matter of taste. So, I perfectly so, agree. But it's not relative. It's not relative, yeah, and that was kind of tricking me off so because I, I like my evaluations to be functions in se of certain type. Like the Even if they, they need infinite number of steps to get Yes, oh, well, that's fine. I mean, it's coming from this like, Polish tradition, <laughs> right, of doing yeah. logic. Like, for a Polish person, modern logic is non-classical logic. <laughs> so, I mean, as soon as you have kind of set theoretical decent structure and you have functions as valuations, then you can do algebraic stuff. Infinity is our friend, not an enemy. So that's fine. But I mean, as long as you are checking, doing something like like relativizing, that's computer science for position for a crash position. That's like oh, that's not 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 clear logic. Right? But I know that in Belgium it's the opposite, right? I mean, modern logics are considered still classical logic, and the really weird logics are considered philosophical or non-classical. But for a Polish person, it's it's slightly. You know, like if Tarski did it, then it's probably classical or the other one. Other questions? Ah, I have a side question. It's really not related to the subject. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I mean, not, not, yeah, no, it's just related to sure, one, go ahead. one slide. No, no, I mean, uh, you know, when you introduce uh, modalities, you were like, oh, we have three values necessity, possibility, and true. Yeah. Right. And so I, I just at that point I just wonder if it can be, you know, uh, necessary but not possible. And oh yes, yes, that's yeah, that's and yeah. you have it in your in your framework and if it's yeah yeah that's exactly what but that's what we exactly <coughs> do here, right? Uh, 
a lot of clicking, <laughs> getting there. Yeah, because I, I look at the axiom and yeah, 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 I wasn't sure if the axiom rule is not not here, here. This is see, this is like yeah, yeah, it was written. Yeah, not yeah, necessarily true. possible. That's yeah, yeah, this is possible. exactly what does. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can go crazy with that. You can uh, like. Uh, uh, how interesting is it? I mean, for for if you try to modelize natural language, it seems very interesting because you can have of kind of a moral duty. Which yeah, are very necessary yes. but not possible. Yeah. But I, don't, I, I just wonder in your framework. Yeah, so this uh, only is up to eight, right? But then, then uh, as I said, Hitoshi Aomori yeah, had this 16, 16 right? Yeah, because but eight is already enough. Yeah, yeah, but then <laughs> it's like me. you can add double negations in the scope of modality. Uh, yeah, so no. it's like because, because from this perspective, this is hyper intentional. That's also an interesting point of view and actually part of the topic of. Can I know? Yes? Of the project that I'm applying actually here mm -hmm. with uh, with Peter, it's it's so so these logics are hyper intentional as well. So so but the, the link has not been uh, neither set up or you know, elaborated or, or investigated actually. So 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 in principle p and not not p are different, mm -hmm. and yeah, then you can just say sure. okay so this is the behavior of p, but you can also look at the behavior of not yeah, not, yeah, yeah. and then you can look at the behavior of not 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 p not not. Yeah, sure. Many, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you talked yeah. about Lukasiewicz yeah. before, so I'm not surprised. I mean, yeah. I would expect exactly. that. Yeah, but but my, no, my question was it seemed to be different, to be necessary but not possible. For me, it's something a bit different. Uh, I mean, yes, yes. Related, yeah, it might be, yes, but I, I didn't explore that. But then, of course, you don't need this thing, right? You don't need the QRQ evaluation. Actually, you can maybe do something else, like. Because th th this works only with, with necessitation and an ongoing project or an ongoing paper or a draft of a paper that I should written, I should be working on for, uh, is to, to kind of play around with this with this filtration procedure to get some other principles. Like for instance, these guys, right? Or some, some, some weak regularity principles. And then, then see whether you can you know, do something interesting here. But coming from your perspective, it can be even perfectly fine to come up with something that hasn't been even come up with, right? These are two different things. And can you strengthen the logic in an interesting way? This is, I don't know. And also, my, my goal is to, to get to, to intuitionistic logic at some point. But I keep failing at that. It's been like three years, and I'm like, oh. Uh, I have a feeling you answer very technically to my question, which is very philosophical, right? Uh, I just wonder if... Yeah, but this is what logicians do, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I totally what agree. do you think about this? No, oh, about... So, so you ask about my intuition about that. Oh, oh, cutso. <laughs> uh, that's a tricky one. Uh, as, as I have like a really slightly engineered uh, mind of an engineer, right? So, 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 so philosophers come to me with, you know, look, we have these intuitions, and do some m magic with, with logic and like, okay, okay. And th th this are, does this action looks okay? Yeah, 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 this one is fine. Okay. This, no, 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 we don't want okay. the system. And so I think like, kind of like, no. That sure, but for your slide, you, you, you wrote it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, because you, you, well, you need a bit of philosophical kind of motivation because otherwise you, you, you can't buy others the same. Well, so there is this word that I've done and there is absolutely nothing philosophical about it. No, that, that, there is a bit of space, but me personally, I just don't like the, 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 the as when it comes to possible words, at least, I just hate this, uh, uh, the aspect that the valuations are relative. It kind of, kind of you know, wraps me in the wrong way. For, 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 I don't know why, it's just my intuition that this is not what, what I think when I think of valuations. Right? There are formulas, and they are either true or false, or whatever your values are, but that's, that's it. There is no kind of contextualized possible world that you can maybe consider. No, that's, no, that's wrong. <laughs> and that's just to not to be, you no know, due to Kripke, like, oh yeah, look, these actions are true in those type of structures. Great, but... I mean, so that's, that's the reason. And as, f as for the distinction between necessary and possible, I, yeah, I'm a logician, so for me, the negations work. You know. So unfortunately, I, I don't think that these are, the, in principle, they are different, right? I think it's, uh, the, the, right. the yeah. duality accents are, are important because otherwise it's. Yeah, yeah that, that's the way I usually think about that. But I was like, oh, maybe this is another option.
No, it might be considered as, as, as one, right? As long as you have valid or like set of intuitions that kind of guides you, then yeah, then, then, then you can start playing around. But if you, mm -hmm. but the, the other way around might be slightly tricky because there are infinitely many systems in, in between. So. Not of all of them are interesting, I guess. Other questions? If not, then I have quite some. Uh, so, first of all, uh, kind of a remark. It's not specifically a question or, or even a remark to you. Maybe interesting. Uh, so, so, because you were talking about the history um, uh, of yes. model logic, and I found it always very surprising that uh, these quite technical uh, proof theoretic systems were first. Like, who comes up with these weird uh, formulas of boxes and diamonds and so on without these in, this intuitions about how, what, what a possible world is and, and, and what, what it is to, to, to access it? I mean, that we have now have such a Kripkean perspective on the whole concept of modality um, that it's kind of hard to, to even understand anymore what, how, how people conceived of modality before uh, Kripke. It seems like it has changed the whole of analytic philosophy in that sense, like mm -hmm. in a fundamental way. Like it's not even possible anymore to go back uh, um, and to I'm see I'm why trying. did they have to try it. Exactly. <laughs> so, 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 uh, um, um, do you have to block uh, these intuitions then uh, 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 to go through this uh, yeah. uh, hard process? Well, so, well, I, like my personal intuition. The, uh, I kind of do the, the how do you, a dead a deadic something from Husserl, right? So I put it in brackets. <laughs> right? so it's there, but not actually actively kind of in my you know, uh, in my consciousness. So I do this, and then I can do the money values approach. But actually, quite often, the, the, quite often the, the the response is like, yeah, those those systems are technically interesting, but I mean, why do we need them? We have cookies about it. Yeah, then, but then I usually reply, yeah, but you can do more here. Oh, yes, but you can go, you know, I mean, creepy semantics in, is intuitive. You can go for weaker systems as well. And then, like, yeah, but that's a strong argument, right? Because you are saying creepy semantics is intuitive for, for the normal logics, right? And what if you introduce three types of possible worlds, the inaccess, the, the, the ones that are normal, non-normal, and the third thing, or the star worlds, whatever, then it's no longer that intuitive. So it's, like, uh, so it's also kind of reversed, right? Because in Kripke, you have this decent structure for normal model logics, but if you want to go down, you need to destroy something, right? You need to either destroy how the relation, the accessibility relation works, or you need to destroy the notion of possible world, and then you can kind of incorporate more logic. But here is, uh, so it's like bottom up, the upper bottom, whatever. So this, the, the, the order is, is reversed. Here you start with very weak logic, and then you need to hammer it down. Kind of, you know, these valuations are wrong. Just <laughs> remove them. So you kind of you know, start with weak logic and go stronger. Whereas in creepy semantics, you start with something that's already quite strong, and then in order to get weaker, you need to de destroy some some of the decent properties. Do you know of any uh, uh, like even more historical uh, roots of? Uh, sort of non-deterministic strategies because it's quite a natural thing to do and I wonder whether like in the, in the Middle Ages or even oh, that in, in, in Aristotle people have not thought about oh, well something can be true, something can be necessarily true, something can be made merely uh, contingently true, these are different states of being like and then you can have uh, 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 yes, sure. think about how they relate to each other um, and, and without this concept of possible worlds, then you automatically go into a kind of uh, uh, non-deterministic. So it's a very natural strategy to do. Do you know whether there is this historical, yeah. very historical uh, pre So the, the short answer for the very historical, no. The, the longer answer is that currently I'm trying to, or I'm writing, let's put it that way, a historical paper on the emergence of of non-deterministic semantics. And one of the pivotal points was the book that you're supposed to, <laughs> to learn for me. So, so it's, I mentioned the paper by Rashad in the 60s something. And actually, my, so I'm writing this paper with Daniel. And Daniel got a, got a hand on that book. 
or got hold of, of that book slightly before me, and then he sent me a couple of pages saying, look, but Russian is stealing those ideas from, from some guy doing quantum, com, quantum something, from the other Polish guy who published something in French that I've never heard of. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, what's happening? So there's like a lot of things that are not explored, which I hear. So they ask me in six months. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I don't know, like, but that's only 20th century, right? Before that, and then I don't know because... That would, be, that, that would be more interesting to me, the really old ones, because then you don't have this yeah. uh, preconceptions. Yeah, but uh, those are also from the beginning of... Yes, yes, you sure, but... They're not preconceptions either. But then we already had so the S5 so IDs and S4 and so on, these systems. Yes, but they were... Very early on. Yes, but they were... They, they, not, I, I'm yeah, not so system. sure to be fair, and B, but they were phrased differently, right? They were not usually phrased by as, as stuff to do with modality, they were phrased as the strict implication. Yes, so these, yes, these, yes. these were just like linguistic intuitions to kind of um, do something about the implication natural language, so I'm not sh So now for us it seems, yeah, you can just interdefine this implication with the box, but back then I'm not so sure if they had this strict intuition. Also, classical logic become established. So at least they yeah. had this implication very strong. When you look at you know the diffusion in Middle Ages between potentiality, virtuality, actuality, they don't even have a stable. Oh yes, the, the classical the logic. So they are much open yeah. to weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, that might be. That could have been. Yeah, but this is something that I also don't have enough kind of. Uh, expertise to actually you know, interpret what what you know, scholastics people had in mind. I should have because I'm Polish, but you know, we do that. That two things that Polish logicians, philosophers do, right? Tom, Thomism and uh, and logic. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, more concretely, uh, so it seems like you could, for philosophical reasons, be interested in broadening this up a little bit to different kinds of modality, where. Um, where this idea that becomes sort of standard, uh, well, well, nobody explicitly endorses it, kind of circles of modality, right? Where you uh, have like sort of uh, 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 mathematical necessity, uh, oh, this, oh. Um, and, and, oh, oh. and then uh, uh, metaphysical, uh, yeah. you know, uh, anomical, yeah. anomic modality, yeah. and maybe technical feasibility or something uh, that, uh, that is still stricter. Um, like you could translate this in, in many truth values, like somebody is something is necessarily but mathematically necessary, uh, something is merely uh, 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 merely physically necessary, uh, but not mathematically necessary, or something like that. Uh, you could have a different truth value, um, yeah. a lower truth value. Than, I mean, so. So, is there any work being done in uh, uh, not for technical reasons but for philosophical reasons, extending the set of true so values? Not that it's I a very natural <coughs> step to take once you can speak of different ways of being true. Uh, okay, so the idea is that not that I'm aware of. So, so now what I'm working on is 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 the the notion of functional completeness in this setting and. That's interesting shopping separately. And the group from uh, Israel, they are working on making this uh, analyticity back or regaining this analyticity. Daniel is working on kind of pushing this idea of like alternative present representation of this semantics in like relational way, like FDE style. So maybe that's something like similar, but he's just like, uh, like maybe not just, but like just reinvent, maybe not reinventing, but restating the results in that kind of framework. Mm -hmm. And there are some benefits and interesting things happening. And yeah, there is some kind of relation between FDE as well. But this is still a like, work in progress. And the Marcello group from Brazil, they work on generalization of that. So they, they are part, this is the passé, right? They are now working on these RN matrices, which are restricted non deterministic matrices. So, yeah. so no one is working on, on this number that you mentioned. And then a, a kind of very uh, um, sort of, it's maybe 
seems a bit skeptical or, or, or destructive question, but it's not intended that way. Um, so there's of course a, like a, a, a with, if you're open to non-determinism, a sort of radical non-determinism possible uh, once you allow filtrate filtrations to simply say there's true two true values false and true, and we're just going to filter out by the actions that is are given to us uh, all the the false uh, uh, model, all the impossible models, uh, um, according to these axioms. Uh, you see all the uh, all the uh -huh, yeah, I see all the uh, valuations that are not without any truth tables, without any structure in the semantics itself. So just like copy the truth, the the, the proof theory hard core uh -huh. uh, or, or directly uh, by just uh, saying well, these models are not allowed. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and then your semantics does nothing anymore, right? It just copies the truth, uh, the, the, the proof theory. Uh, well, well, not necessarily, right? You can still guide, set it, it can guide some of your uh, proof theoretic results. Uh, well, maybe it, it can help, but it doesn't uh, provide any new information. It's just two truth values and they sure, do basically yes. nothing. Uh, uh, the, the filtration is completely on the basis of uh, of, of what the actions do. Uh, and sure. The actions are proof theory. I mean, so, yeah, so, I know, so there is no information added or something, yeah. or no different insights gained. Um, I see. I see. And then, so my question would be, uh, uh, if this is like the the, the the thing we don't want for philosophical reasons, uh, because it gives no information at all, it may guide us indeed uh, in some cases, uh, but. Um, you clearly want more because you have more values than just the two. Uh, you want to add structure. Well, um, but to be fair, I have dimensional values, right? For each of the dimensions, I still have two, so I can kind of. Uh, so you, yeah. Um, I can say no. There are only true values, but the values are triples, and at, at each of the place in the in the, the internal relation, you have one of two. Yeah, but also I'm not sure that so even if, if you if you start with this perspective of the like proof theoretic semantics or whatever it's called, that the only thing that you need is like there are two values, you have plenty of valuations, and then you just on top of that you put some axioms and then you just remove the valuations. Then yeah, but where do you get the axioms in the first place? Well, I'm basing my axioms on certain semantical intuitions about language, right? Yeah. Or about stuff. So yeah. it's so it, there is some kind of semantics that is like, or pre-semantics that is that is your decision on adopting certain action based on. Yeah. And then there is your semantics, and the problem is how this semantic and this semantic relate, right? Because it might be that it seems as if it does not give us any new information, but in principle, this already gave us the information, and those two things are really connected. So the the, the, the shape of this semantic can be influenced by this pre pre-axiomatic or uh, intuition that you know allowed you to, to adopt certain action. Sure, but the decision could then be to just call that the semantics already. The, the, the first step, the, the, the not see the yes. proof theory as uh, something purely syntactic, but that's really what the uh, yes, but then what it means. Sure, uh, yeah, but then you can call this semantics, but then you can still do the mathematical analysis of this stuff, and then you are basically here. Right, because then it, you know, it's like, so how do you analyze this? Well, I'm putting some accents on top of that. Well, where do you get your accents from? Well, so there is this intuition that I have. So it's like a vicious circle in a way, right? Yeah, but, but um, so I guess my question would be, um, if you can do it with two values, uh, why, what is interesting about doing it with more than two? You uh, mean model logic? Yeah, or any logic. Uh, oh, because you can't do it with two values, right? Yeah, but but but, but why would you need more? Why would you want more? Uh, why would you want more structure in the mat matrices itself? Uh, oh, that's because well, so the, the 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 short answer is that you can't do use you can't have only two values and keep the elegance and simplicity of logical matrix. Right? If you want to have two values, like in creepy semantic, then you don't have something elegant as, as logical matrix. You have Kripke framework, right? And then 
Yeah, yeah, but no, I mean with matrices, eh? matrices that are restricted by uh, actions. Yes, but then you, you can do a lot of stuff with two values, right? Yes, but uh, why would you want to do it more than two? Oh, because... Oh. You can already do it with two. Because there are certain contexts that you that two values are not enough. Like you can, like you are there. We, 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 yes, like for instance, if you are intuitionistic, you believe that you don't have this axiom. You cannot do anything with logical mapping that has two values. And from sure. te from technical reason, no, the Gorgias proved that, right? Or sorry, Gettle. Yeah, but without without the first filtration. Yeah, but the filtration is not known, and also it's not known whether you can find this type of filtration for that. Okay, but once we do, would find a way to filter. Oh, that's then awesome for me. Then yeah, then, then just go for two values. <laughs> but I don't. But for intrinsic logic, it would be pretty simple to do that. No, you just have it's, it's all combination of, of all formulas that might be one or true, uh, uh, true or false. Uh, and then you just check, does this uh, valuation respect my actions of intrinsic logic? Does this valuation, does this valuation, and you just only uh, uh, keep as, as correct those that do respect the... Uh, uh, yeah, wait, 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 wait. So it's it's I'm not so sure, actually. What can go wrong? Well, like, for instance, what... The set of valuations, maybe it's not going to be a recursive, so you cannot actually uh, put them in check. That's one of the things, right? And also the set of valuations that you are left out with at the end of the procedure may not be recursive, so you know that there is a set of valuations. Okay, which one? No one knows. There is no algorithm. So as soon as you provide me an algorithm for doing that and saying, he likes function, there yeah, must be a exactly, function. Yeah. <laughs> then I then happy, I'm happy for that. But it's just, I don't believe it's going to be that easy. Yeah. Unless um, you see the album, then, then we can work on that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Because this this already is like straightforward, what you are doing, but then the, there is no algorithm, right? It's extremely non-trivial how to check if the valuation is actually going to be preserved. Uh -huh. And then for intuitionistic logic, then I don't know how you would start. First, this filtration procedure, you need to have the, the, the values that you are filtrating against in a way, right? So you need this super designated and designated. But if you have only two values, yeah, yeah then you, which of the values are you going to remove them? I have some intuitive ideas, but, but maybe they are very uh, in the wrong direction. Um, but uh, let's, let's discuss that another time. Um, yeah, but in, in principle, there is this thing, or they, there was these things of like starting with various types of axioms and then checking which of the axioms you can add and which you can't, so that the resulting thing is like, like you start with empty logic and then you add more exponents and then you try to come up with truth tables. And then you add this, what do you need to change in truth tables, and blah, blah, blah. But you can, uh, we cannot separate certain axioms. Like, you cannot separate the, the law of double negation, for instance. And then there is, there is the, the results by this, ah, cut stuff. The, the, the chief of all of the Russian logic, uh, uh, Larisa Maximova. And she has this result that there are infinitely many logics that you can actually like, like separate it, but if you want to have interpolation theory, there are seven. <laughs> so there are like plenty of these like limited, limitative results uh, with respect to what you can algebraically do with two values. So it's not as simple as, uh, unless maybe you are, I mean, if you find an algorithm, I'm sure. And it's probably something I'm not looking. Uh, and other questions? Yes, yeah, so first, uh, I don't want to. No, 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 no. I'm just. Uh, I'm curious. Yeah, you, 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 you said for a few seconds that, okay, you can see your approach in the filtration as establishing relation between possible world if we were yes. doing some isomorphism between the two. Could you say more? Uh, the short answer is is, is, is no, but <laughs> the long answer because there is an intuition. Because yeah. because just to <laughs> give you where I'm coming from. Yeah, okay. When I have to teach semantic of possible world, what is extremely shocking for the engineer mind, like you said, is that there's no metric, there's no relations between the stuff. It's just they are there. Yeah. Mm. And so of course mm. you have a relative valuation. 
per world because you don't have real relation between them established for more. Yeah. But what you're saying is that your formalism it's like establishing relations this to, some extent, yeah. to some extent between possible worlds that can be formalized. I think so. So, so my rough idea, I guess, I mean, I just find that I'm already overcommitted, but uh, rough idea is that uh, so you have this zero level, and then you have valuations at zero level, right? That's a list then. So, here is the list. That's uh, slightly abstract. Right? And then these are the zero level, right? And then we have the first level. And then we let's go and let's go like this. And then we have second level, and so on, right? But actually, if we look at these things, these actually are maximally consistent sets of, of, of formulas, right? So they are actually possible worlds. So we have this like, set of possible worlds, somewhat, if I, that corresponds to this zero level collaboration. And then at the first level, what we do, we just remove some of them. And then I, and then you can kind of like try to impose the structure. So, so, so saying that, but what's the principle, right? If you look for the from the perspective of box operator, right? Where do you put the accessibility relation, or how do you translate the formulas? Because, for instance, one way of doing that would be for each of the propositional parameters in pre-systematic, just go for the translation of the truth value, right? So, if valuation zero, for instance, assigns to be T diamond, then you just put in the in the possible world, for instance, P box P diamond P. Right? And then C. Because these are not the, these are not going to be like this will not give you the, the possible world semantics, right? Because these are weaker logics. And then maybe you could see what the, the filtration procedure does from the perspective of cryptic semantics. But this is really vague. Because actually what it does, it kind of relates to something kind of relates the, the valuations in some way, but the valuations are more, right? So it kind of mm -hmm. puts some kind of structure here as well, by default, I think. No idea. Maybe it's necessary, but not possible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Like, time is finite, unfortunately. I'm not that, I'm not that quick. And also, I don't want to go Tarski way in the sense of I don't want to sniff cocaine to do the research. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not Tarski, this is Eutos. Yeah, but it shows life in logic. In, uh, yeah. So, so it, I, I wholeheartedly kind of recommend that to, to read this. Like, a lot of interesting stories. Another question I would have is um, whether this link um, with Gödel's theorem um, that was apparently used in the first proof. Uh, but that's Gödel's theorem for the lack of matrix semantics for intuitionistic logic. Uh -huh. so that's that's not Gödel's theorem. No, that's not incomplete. Oh, um, then my question becomes, is there a link with Gödel's theorem? Because a lot of things look like it, uh, like Tarski indefinability, uh, yes, the theorem is very close to Gödel's yes, I uh, don't know because I, theorems and so on. I don't work with first order languages, and this is something that you... Oh. Well, well, in principle, in my PhD, as you know, I tried to use this type of logics for informal probability. Right, so I was trying to establish the link between the theorem and non deterministic semantics. Well, yeah. But it was a lot of work and I was not extremely well happy with the results. So either I'm too stupid or these things are really hard <laughs> or impossible. Because like if you have some limited results often that says something about the expressibility and about translatability to other well known yes. systems and then sure. you know. And, and I don't know, a lot of, I mean, with matrices you can do in a hidden way a lot of mathematics. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, 
if you have the functions right, you can like do already pretty complicated stuff in there. Yes. So it's not. It wouldn't be extremely surprising that 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 part of arithmetic can be sort of by sure. brute or hidden in a hidden way yeah. handled inside. Uh, um, especially if you have an infinite a number of values. Exactly. But I guess that's excluded. But, 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 uh, that, but that's that's the, that's that's also one of the of the points why a stick to finitely many values is that if you go for infinitely many values. The non-deterministic semantics is equivalent to normal matrix semantics. Ah, you don't add anything by going on exactly. deterministic. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Already from uh, just omega infinity. Uh, uh, I, uh, I think in the paper they just said infinity. So I assume for all or not. Uh. It's Anna Zamansky and Abram. They did prove this. Yeah, they, they, wow. Then they become equivalent. But the interesting parts are if you keep the set of values finite, because then you actually increase the. the yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is actually what what, what Russia didn't see, because then he thought that you can actually represent the non-deterministic stuff. But that's another paper that is being written. Right? So the the idea is that I think at least, or I. I think that Brescher's idea was that if you whenever you have this choice, sorry, uh, like let's say you have, let's go and use this, right? Then basically, what you are, what how you would represent this is by adding new value to your semantics, and then you just instead of four value semantics, you have five value semantics, and then the fifth value is the non-deterministic value. That's so, no problem, but I, 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 it's not clear if there is no problem, and I think that it is not a problem for certain specific class, but I didn't prove it yet. <laughs> Namely, it is not a problem as long as the values are of the same uh, uh, polarity, let's say, right? Either uh, both are designated or both are not designated. Then I think you can actually add any such combination as an additional value, and then just trans translate the evaluation function as this. But if you have this thing of opposite polarity, then if you add this, then yeah, but would you go for designated or non-designated? Because in non-deterministic settings, it sometimes behaves as designated, sometimes as non-designated. And for those, I think you can prove that you cannot, if as soon as you can represent one of these, then you cannot determine, determinize the non-deterministic matrix or matrix. But I think I know how to prove it, but I didn't have time to do that because I need to teach, so I have to now I'm like preparing the slides all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much work. So that, that would be really interesting. Yeah, but that's working progress. It's working progress. It's like already up a page, so the theorem is stated. We have two minutes left. So right, no, I'm sorry, I was still thinking about this possibility to be uh, necessary, <laughs> but not possible. No, 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 but I think it's more interesting than uh, no, I thought no, previously. No, 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 it can be an interpretation of good but theory. But did you not answer? No, 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 yeah, no, but just uh, no, share IP. <laughs> so, no, 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 let's imagine you have a differential equation. We have a theorem saying that the solution exists, but sometimes you cannot find the solution. There is, it's, it's a non constructive theorem, right? So maybe, yeah. maybe it can be. Can, and I, 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 you can use the theorem for uh, apophantic uh, equation, I think, just to show that the answer exists, but you cannot uh, uh, systematically prove it. So maybe, maybe we, we, we can just make a difference between being necessary, and necessary is all the proof which are non constructive. And possible, which are the constructive one. And it's related to both good and um, intuition. Yeah. But I think it would be a nice framework. So th that, that was my idea to approach intuitionistic logic, actually, where I use capital T as well being you know, constructively the case only, whereas small t was either classically the case, so either there is informal proof, or f sorry, either there is direct or indirect proof. Yeah, I failed. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I just want to say what you said. The problem <coughs> is that the problem, or one of the problems that I, I had is that here you, you need to. So the, the idea is that you start with some weaker logic, 
And then on top of that, we can logically build the, the filtration and then you arrive at the stronger logic, right? So in the case of intuitionistic logic, the stronger logic would be intuitionistic. But then it was going to be the weaker logic. And then I tried all this like positive fragment of something, right? Of is it minimal logic called? Like one of the like this decently behaved fragment of propositional logic without this double negation. And then I was like, yeah, I'll just add nothing about negation, and then I'll just use negation and do the filtration according to negation, voila, boom, big result. And almost for free, right? Because all the theorems probably will be more or less the same. But then it turned out that the starting logic is already too complex, and there is, I couldn't find non deterministic semantics for that point. <laughs> okay, maybe it's slightly harder. <laughs> So yeah, that, so that that actually was an intuition that I tried to do, to start with, but I failed, and then I just start doing these things. Okay, uh, thank you very much.